Um, obviously, my name is James. Uh, I'm glad the doctor make it out tonight. This is my first talk at the Cleveland News Group, oddly enough, uh, so it's really cool to be here. Hopefully you guys are all interested in the Web API tonight, because that's what I'm going to be talking about. If not, you might be in for a very boring hour and a half. Uh, I apologize in advance. Might still be boring, no promises. So, at some point, no matter what, how long we've been doing this, or where we're at in our career, we've probably seen some sort of diagram like this in a book or a magazine or somewhere else. And it's this idea of this kind of interconnected network of computers. And it started way, way, way back when we had just dumb terminals attached to mainframes. And it's kind of evolved over the years. When I first, and I'm going to be dating myself a little bit here, when I first got involved uh, with software development, we were in this cool client server thing, which was really just a fancy way of saying we have a bunch of fat clients running on people's PCs, and we have a database off somewhere in some data center. Not very sophisticated, but it got the job done. As things evolved, we kind of got into this more broader, more kind of fancy idea of distributed computing with things like DCOM or CORBA, with all these kind of competing standards. And that was a step, but it was a very difficult step. A lot of times these things were very difficult to write. They were difficult to debug. They were, they had these standards that were very vague and sometimes didn't really work between each other, even though they were supposed to. But we kind of persevered. And then the web came out. And web pages obviously were the first big step. Web applications got more sophisticated. And around the time .NET 1.0 shipped, there was this concept of web services. The web had already been out for a little while. I remember using Mosaic, the first web browser, when I was in college. So it, the web was old news by this point. The web pages were old news. But this idea of web services, being able to get data from a website, just like I get a web page from a website, was new. And with .NET 1.0, shipped their implementation of web services, which are known as .NET Web Services, or sometimes called ASMX, because they use a .ASMX extension. And they were very kind of SOAP-based web services, because at the time, that's what businesses wanted. And if you aren't familiar with SOAP, it initially started off as a, as a um, standard for RPC calls on Unix machines. And that never really took off, so it got repurposed into this idea of using it as a web service transport for businessy kind of things. That led to the WS Star protocols, things like addressability, reliability, all the things that businesses care about. And it was all cool, and it all was looked great on paper, it all kind of seemed very interesting, but nobody wanted to do it. No developer out there was screaming, I can't wait to write me some web services. I'm going to go home this weekend and just write web services for fun. That was a phrase not said by anyone ever. Maybe me. And because of that, I think if the world hadn't had a couple major changes, things would have stayed like that. I think this idea of web services and distributed computing would have really stagnated. And we'd still kind of be in that, well, yeah, i got to go write a web service. I guess, uh, I guess I'll go drink about six beers and do that. But something happened that kind of changed things. Mobile devices became very popular. The iPhone came out and proved you can make a great mobile device that people want to use, and not just for business for the force. I, mean, I, I don't know how many of you guys had the old Windows 6.1 Windows phones. They were cool, but they weren't exactly fun to use. So you didn't see a lot of things for them that were recreational. It was mostly, yeah, I got Outlook, and I got a browser, and I got a GPS. Those are the things I need to get worked on. I can basically function somewhat away from the office. It wasn't really, you know, my, my my 10-year-old sister wasn't clamoring for a Windows 6 phone. But the iPhone came out, and the iPhone was cool. And then Kindles, and Android, and Android tablets, and all these other things came out. And the thing that really kind of spurred the growth in these, if you remember the iPhone, it was cool, but what really forced all of this to take off wasn't the browser or anything else. It was applications. If you remember, iPhones were selling well, but they didn't really take off until Apple finally released an SDK. So that's cool, we can have apps now, but that's still a mobile device. And theoretically, I'm on a network, but I'm also kind of stuck inside this little 3 by 5 box. How do I get, and, and that's really no fun. I want to talk to people, I want to interact with other people. How do I do that? Soap? 
Soap is not a lot of fun to begin with, so nobody's going to want to do it. Secondly, soap is not really super interoperable. Part of the problem is it's a very complex standard, and when you create complexity in standards, you create different implementations. And lastly, SOAP is very large. So I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen a SOAP message. Once you start piling on some of those WS features, it gets longer and longer and longer and bigger and bigger, and, a lot of, and you're paying for bandwidth now with your cell phone. Every couple months, I'll get a bill, or I'll just, I gotta hide this from the wife somewhere, so she doesn't see it, so I'm in big trouble. So, REST came to the rescue. And REST is not anything new. It wasn't anything cooked up in a lab because there was a need. It was basically how the web is supposed to work. How many of you guys have used a REST service? All right, let me ask that a different way. How many of you guys have ever opened a web browser and gone to a web page? Congratulations, you've used a REST web service. All REST does is it says, I have a bunch of data or assets or something out on the internet, resources. Don't care what it is. I look at the web as a platform for resource storage. And what I want to do is I want to interact with those resources. They're out there somewhere. I just want a way to work with them. That's all REST does. In the case of a web browser, when you go to www.amazon.com, what that's doing, and this will make sense hopefully in a few minutes if it doesn't already, it's creating a REST command with a GET verb or the Amazon address saying whatever's at that address, just get it and bring it back to me. Now in the case of a web browser at Amazon.com, it happens to be a string of text that's HTML, your browser can render it, and boom, the page comes up. But that is not all REST is. It can be MP3 files, it can be pictures, it can be binary files, it doesn't matter. REST doesn't care what it's moving, it's just moving things. And that's a very simple idea, but it's very powerful when you get, get right down to it. The big thing about REST is obviously, the first thing is, where do I find things? This is where the first major component of REST, there's going to be two. Obviously the address is where your location is going to be. The next one is the verb. Okay, I know where my resource is, what do I want to do with it? There's a fairly limited number, we'll go over them. But those are really it. Those two things are REST. Where is this resource? What am I doing? Any questions? I know that's kind of a big concept. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. Okay? It's very easy to use. And it's very interoperable. Like I mentioned with SOAP, the, the, the specification is so big, especially when you start adding this WS star stuff onto it. It gets very complicated, very open to interpretation. REST is less so because it's a very small standard, it's very finite, and it really doesn't tell you much other than there's a resource, go figure out something to do with it. End of story. So there's very little room there. for. There's a lot, not a lot of work with pieces, so it's very hard to mess up, theoretically. So that's a little dark, so I apologize. Uh, but the first thing we talked about with REST is this idea is this URI, this Universal Resource Identifier. Sometimes also referred to as a URL, either way is right. In most REST books or REST documentation, you're going to see it referred to as a URI. It's really a semantic difference, whatever. But that's going to tell me where my asset lives. And one thing I'll notice about these is that. They're kind of easy to read. I mean, if you look at all three of these, you could probably figure out pretty quickly what they represent, right? I, I call this the, person, the uh, human test. And if this is from just a normal human being, they'd probably say, okay, well, that probably gives me a stock quote for Microsoft. I made the mistake of showing this to a cousin who's an actual stockbroker. I said, you're missing a ton of stuff there. It doesn't have time, it doesn't have span, it doesn't have time. I'm like, oh, do whatever, right? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> So I learned a lesson, don't show this to my cousin. Uh, this one probably gives me a list of articles about WCF from the eponymous stuff.org. And then if I go out here to weather dude, this is probably going to give me a seven-day forecast for where I live. That happens to be my zip code. Please don't stop me. 
So that's very easy to figure out. I can look at those and I can understand what's happening. The other thing I can do, if I'm getting data from this, I can cache this information. SOAP-based web services don't allow you to cache what happens. And the reason is because those are not thinking in terms of resources or thinking in terms of calls to methods. If you call a method in your application, you're not expecting it to just not run. You're expecting it to execute and do something, right? SOAP is the same way. So the ability to cache this is very powerful too, especially if you're on a site with a lot of bandwidth. When it comes to creating your URIs and organizing your information, organizations are important. There's a few different ways to do this. The same way isn't the best way for everybody. Sometimes you want to do it by category. For one of the examples there, we had a list of articles. Maybe you want to category, do it by category of articles. We have one article for list of category for CSS and category for Python and a category for functional languages. That could be a good way to do that. Maybe do it by time. And the stock quote thing, I just mentioned, apparently time is a big deal. So maybe I want to organize that somehow by time, by day, or by time slice. Maybe I want to take a one hour time slice. Location. The weather example. I don't necessarily care, sorry guys, I don't necessarily care if the weather is up here if I'm not coming up here. I'm more concerned with whether there is going to be in my house. Can I grow up that night? That's my concern. That's what drives me on a day to day basis. Alphabetically, this actually comes in handy, especially the example I'm going to show you guys later is basically an online phone book. That can be very helpful with that. I want to find a list of people, but I don't, if I have 5,000 people in my directory, I don't necessarily want all 5,000 people brought back. I can do it by last name or first name. Maybe department's another thing I can do. I can list it alphabetically as well. This is going to make it easier for users to find and use your information, the way you organize it. Now again, two things to keep in mind. As I said when I started with this slide, there is no one right way to organize your data, even within your own shops, even within your own projects. You might be looking at this and think, well, location and alphabetically both make sense. Well, the good news is you can do both. You can set up your URIs so they can either access by location or alphabetically by last name. I want people in the accounting department. They want to say that's a location. Or I want everybody whose last name starts with a G. You can get to the same resources those ways. So don't feel like you're backed into a corner by having to pick one way to organize data. You can have multiple paths to the same thing. Now you have to keep in mind though, when you're writing data, if you write based on the location, it's going to also override what's there alphabetically. But if you do a good job thinking out and planning out your URIs, that shouldn't make a difference. Okay. Any questions on URIs before we get into verbs? You guys have been doing. You guys. Well, I'm guessing most of you guys are web developers. Okay. So you you guys have probably been doing web sites and URIs for most of your professional lives. So that's probably you're probably good on that. Verbs might be something that's a little bit different, especially for some of you who have not been doing, who haven't done ASP.NET Classic, or have been really living in the web forms world. Uh, for a lot of professional career. This is basically, okay, I've identified where my re where the resource is, where it's located. Now what do I want to do with it? For those of you who are doing web development, two of these will look very familiar. How many of you guys are familiar with when you do a form, you do form action, and it's either get or post? You guys have seen that before, right? Who knows what that means? Read and write. Very close, yes. Those are basically telling that web service what I want to do. For web forms, it uses just the two, but there's actually four you guys are going to see on a not quite day-to-day -day basis, but four you're going to see very frequently when doing web API development. If you look at the standard, there's like a dozen, but eight of them, hardly, I've, they hardly ever get used, so don't worry about them until you need to. The first one is get. <laughs> this does exactly what you think. It says, here's a location, go get me whatever is out there. And bring it back to me. That was the web browser example I talked about at the beginning. I don't do gets differently if it's a different type of content. My get for a web page is exactly the same as my get if it's a MP4 or a picture or whatever. Press doesn't care. It just says, okay, here it is. So yeah, get is for getting. 
post is for creating. And to kind of carry the analogy for web forms further, post is when you're saying, I'm making a change. When I do a get on a web form, my expectation is I'm not changing anything on the server. When they submit this form, nothing destructive is going to happen. When I say destructive, what I mean is data is not going to change. I can hit that button a million times, and nothing on my back end is really going to, nothing on my back end is going to be altered. My service administrator might get mad at me. But the data up there is going to stay the same. With a post, my expectation is that that data is going to change. And so the difference between the two is obviously a get I can cache, a post I cannot. Because that post is going to execute and make a change every time. The other difference is you'll see, and this is again drawing the parallel to web forms, is, or HTML forms, I should say. When I do a get, I'm putting everything in that query string. Because I don't have a message body, I just have a message header. When I do a post, I have a message body, and that's where all my data is going to go. And this will make sense a little bit more when you see Fiddler. And so what happens is a lot of people who do web development, who don't really understand the distinction between get and post, will say, well, sure I know what the difference is. Get means everything goes in the query string, and post means everything goes in the body. That's true, but that's not the point. So it's a good idea to keep that in mind and remember, even if you don't do any web API work going forward, to remember the distinction between get and post for your web development. It's going to help you out. It's going to make you look really smart, and all the other web developers are going to be, oh, you're so smart. <laughs> Maybe. I can't promise that. <clears throat> So those are the two. Those are the two most common ones. Those are the ones probably most of you already know being web developers. The next one is called put. And put is a little tricky. It's not the right word. But there is some context around how put works. What put is basically doing is saying, I'm going to create a resource. And in that way, it works just like post. The difference is with post, I'm not deciding where in the hierarchy that resource is going to live. My back end is, is deciding. If I post a picture up to Flickr, it's saying, okay, we've had to rename your file because, believe it or not, somebody already has a file up here named dog.jpg. I know. Crazy. <laughs> so we named it some really obnoxiously long number .jpg. That's a post. Post says, I'm going to decide, me being the back end, where that lives. Put is different. Put allows you to specify where that resource exists. So in these two examples 